The following feature has language or content of an adult nature. How, how are you getting on with that? Um, it's not a Fuji camera, so... No. Are we allowed to... But it's not really a camera. Hang on. Warning. Warning. <laughs> Non-Fuji camera. Uh, how are you getting on with that that, uh, that thing that follows you everywhere? Yeah, it's... What, you mean Gemma? Spy cam. <laughs> yeah, Gemma, yeah. No, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. It's an Ozbot tail. Ozbot, that's it. Ozbot tail. OS. B-O-T or O-Z? O-S. B-O-T okay. tail. It's yeah. uh, it's another Chinese kind of startup. I, I kick-backed, kick-backed it. A Kickstarter? Kickstarted it. Yeah. Kickstarted it. I backed it on Kickstarter. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, God, that's going to that's gonna worry the Americans even more, isn't it? Like, <laughs> there, there's there's something across coming across from China that follows your every move. I know. And I also have my hoa ho You're never going back to America. Uh, uh, yeah. What do you have of those Malins coming in? So, yeah. No, it's 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 here. It's cool. And um, yeah. I like I said, I backed it and it's so, so I was an early adopter, um, and yeah, it kind of it, it literally sits there and follows it, you everywhere. It just follows you, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it works out your body shape and everything, doesn't it? It's, it's not like the traditional looking for an eye or a face or something. It's no, work- no, it does it by uh, they they call it advanced AI. Yeah, it even followed somebody on a on a television screen. Yeah, it? it's 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 quite incredible. Oh, right. It's quite incredible. I just thought it'd be a good idea if we we could get hold of another one. Mm. Um, to just um, I'm throwing this one in here as a thought mm-hmm. um, because the mailbag is so good. Mm. And, and so bulging that uh, maybe we should do uh, maybe we should do a Q and A mop up sometime and do it not as a podcast but do it as a YouTube thing. Yeah, and uh, then get cool. the Ozbot to record, you know, because it could follow us as we walk around the studios. Often we do. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that'd be cool. I like the Ozbot, and I like that idea yeah. too. There's me, there me angling for, for a. Yeah, for a free I might thing. have to. We we wouldn't be able to do that one in our pajamas, though, would we? Uh, no, and I'd probably stop wearing the dress as well. The Fuji Cast. Right. Um, hello. This week. Thank you to our friends at Simpler Straps, again, for letting us uh, give away this military-grade rugged camera strap to uh, each of our favourite email questions of the week. We will have two of those coming up. Are you all right? You've... I, just, I just headbutted the mic, you, sorry. Is that what that bump was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about those, go to simpler.us, spelled S-I-M-P-L-R.us. We are going to talk about ex-weddings in just a moment. Part two of a two-parter with John Swanell, the... Um, the we, we called him a royal photographer last week, but he's so much more. He's been involved in fashion as well, and and he was an assistant to to David Bailey uh, right at the start. So um, wasn't part, he part also the photographer that took the pictures for um, that very famous painter who used to paint? And they never let him into the uh, the Royal Academy of Arts because he used to paint photographs from photographs. I do wish you'd give me these questions before I talk to him. <laughs> That would have been I, such an interest. Oh, I love his work. He's a very famous <laughs> painter. He sits in it. He's got a little studio in Chelsea and just I mean, knocks uh, out hundreds of paintings every day. Okay. He's like no. the most wealthy pa- artist in, on, in the UK, but he I can't get in the... Um, really? Oh, no. I just don't know who you're uh, talking about. Okay, I'll describe one of the paintings. It's a painting. Yeah. And it's a, I like games. a, I like a butler on a beach. Right, He's standing beach. there with his, uh, with his glass and champagne in his hand. Yeah. And the woman and the man are sat on a table on a beach and a nice sunset. Very famous painting. Um, oh, my God. I want to say... Uh, butler on a beach painting. painting. Yeah. Oh, it's come up there. Painting. It is. There he is. There he is. The singing butler, framed art. There we go. Click on that. The. Uh, click on which what's his bit? name? What's his name? Um, That's him. This one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jack Vetriano. Jack Vetriano. So I think John Swanell is you're right. the person yeah, who yeah, takes yeah. the photos yeah, that yeah. Jack Vetriano paints. Uh, I. Yeah. I'm not sure where I got that connection. I never asked that question. I think <sighs> it's him though. I'm sure it's that him. was not in my research notes. Yep. Mm. Anyway, um, your questions too about anything Fujifilm or photography related, technical geek worthy, and so on. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Last week we didn't mention that email address enough, so click at fujicast.co.uk. There's another self indulgent minute. Thank you so much for the wonderful reviews and some of the not so wonderful ones that you've <laughs> been leaving <laughs> at, at Apple Podcasts. Right. Um, X wedding. Should we uh, dip into that first of all? Yeah. Yeah. We meant you, or you mentioned you, you had the bright idea of a competition last week, and then completely forgot the way we do competitions on this podcast. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, as you may or may not know, X Weddings Conference is coming up in November 13th and 14th yep. in uh, Bath, in England. The website, which I, I didn't mention last week either, is uh, www.x weddings.co.uk. Much like this podcast, it, you do not need to be a Fujifilm photographer to no, attend it. No, not at all. No, um, we've got some great speakers. We've got Neil, myself, uh, Wojta Hurt. 
Oh, Voight. <laughs> ah, <Hurt. laughs> yeah. Voight is going to be Bless so, him. so... Bless him. Such a nice guy. Soraya Cordova, so Cordoville, across, yeah. Chris Parkinson, Scott yeah. Johnson, yep. and Matt Thompson as yeah. well from York Play Studios. Um, so, yeah, come along. Tickets are available on the website. Um, and uh, the competition, we will be... So, uh, as we mentioned last week, those of you that would like to have a chance of winning a free place at the uh, keynote day then uh, on your emails to us on your normal questions and the email address is click at futurecast.co.uk just mention that you would also like to be considered for the ex-weddings yeah. free ticket and we will creatively pick somebody out of a hat somehow uh, Neil and myself and we will uh, we will put the winner on the website as per usual and I will email you directly we should have one of your dogs actually pick the winner but all the all the my dog speaks <laughs> Is it that one? Uh, no, that sounds a little bit like <laughs> something else. <laughs> uh, no, my dog does speak. When I say him, same to my dog, yeah. what's your name? He'll say, <laughs> and I'll say, you know, what's... If I don't say anything, he doesn't speak. And mm-hmm. when me and Gemma are having a conversation, he stands in the middle and, and nods his head back and forth and can't have a name? conversation with us. Breeze. I couldn't think of Breeze's name. Breeze. 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 Who's the whippet? Breeze. Monty Is it border. true, Breeze, that you are an England rugby fan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, that's the same it, answer I would give. Actually, such a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, can we just take one of the with the ex weddings this week? Can we just take one of the the photographers and talk a little bit more, maybe about Voit Hurd? <laughs> I'm doing it now. You started <laughs> Voit Hurdich, um, spelt V O J T A. Um, th- his work is just phenomenal. It's it. I, I would I would call it honest. Yeah. I think as a photojournalist, I'm going to have to click onto the English version of the website because I don't speak Czech. No, <laughs> okay. um, that's better. Yeah, I, I honestly, I, I mentioned it last week, so I don't want to kind of repeat that. But I saw his work in in Prague, and, and I, I just loved it straight away. And I subsequently, what I didn't mention last week, I, I subsequently went to a conference that he'd organised in oh. the east of Czech Republic on right. the. Uh, Poli- near the Polish border. Did you fact. fly there especially? Yeah, yeah, I did a talk at one of his conferences, um, oh. and uh, it was a massive, massive. They had like six hundred people there. Wow. Pretty much, it's the biggest wedding conference in the whole of he had organised Eastern that. Europe. Him and a few other people right. organised it. Okay. Yeah, uh, and a brand agnostic. Yeah, brand agnostic. Right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, they had lots of people there. Uh, and of course, I can't speak a word of Czech mm-hmm. a, at all, mm. and uh, the, neither most of the people there couldn't speak any English, so they had uh, live translation. Um, oh, a little bit like the Seville, um, what's yes, it called? FDF. FDF. Yeah, which I always thought was very clever. You would sit there with headphones on, you're listening to all the speakers. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, so yeah, I saw him there, and uh, really nice guy, really really amazing wedding photographer. But beyond that, um, you're right, his pictures speak to me yeah. as well as you, I'm sure. Uh, it's reportage work. If you go to his website, it's great. Yeah, and I'm going to go on his. I'm going to sit in on his one day workshop. I'm not going to sit in on yours. I'm going to sit in on his. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard me bang on forever yeah. about sound. Yeah, I might go and sit in his as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take. I'll take the people going to mine. We'll go and sit in there. We'll record him audio. Yeah, 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 yeah. So ex weddings. Oh, we, uh, did you say the date? Yes, 13th, 14th, November 2019. And one of the, the things that I thought was r- really nice about the, the conference, and, and I know that I spoke to it, and I know I'm doing a second day th- thing here on sound as well, but and, and film and sound and all that sort of stuff, was, was um, and I know you go to a lot of conferences where people meet up in the bar, obviously, and uh, the little, the après ski, if you like, of a mm. conference. And um, but this one was we several groups sort of all went out and did different things and well, I went on one we went to an Indian restaurant and there was a massive table and we were all yeah. sort of throwing ideas in yeah. and having a chat and I, I I learned so much from talking to other people on that on, on and just the social social times that we had yeah no it was good it was a lot of fun a lot of fun yeah. very yeah. stressful but a lot of fun <laughs> stressful for you because <laughs> you're organising it but the rest of us we had a ball yeah. <laughs> Right, um, questions. You going first or me? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, This is from uh, Christoph Modot. Okay. Uh, Hi, Neil and Kevin. I am from Montreal, Canada, and I'm using a Olympus EM10 for two years now. Mm. Actually, um, a friend of mine uh, gave me his Olympus EM10 a couple of weeks ago just to kind of have a look at it, and it's a nice little camera, really Mm. nice. Um, My question is related to noise in low-light conditions. I don't see any problems to go beyond 1,600 ISO, but it gets a lot more noticeable after that personally i don't mind and like the analog feel of it in my pictures but i was wondering if you encountered any comments from customers do you do any post pro- 
process in at all for mm. noise reduction mm. or in camera. Do you choose sometimes to take a picture in black and white because of a low light and noisy condition? Do you do much noise reduction? No. I. So the way that I deal with things is I, I use, I set my auto ISO and I'm very happy for it to go up to 12,800. Yep, if that's it where needs mine to. is. Yeah. Rarely does it go that high these days, but, um, you mm-hmm. know, and, that, and that's because the cameras are smaller so we can hand hold mm. at lower shutter speed, mm. right? Um, and but I don't worry about it at all when I'm shooting. Like, n- doesn't even cross my mind. If it, if I see the camera hitting twelve thousand eight hundred, I don't think, oh my god, I've got a lot of work to do with that. Um, what I do when I get back to the studio and I import all of my images into either Alien Skin or Lightroom, but mm-hmm. they can both do smart collections. Um, and I gr- I categorize by ISO. So I have a smart collection of ISO 6,400 and mm-hmm. above, 3,000 to 6,400, et cetera, et cetera. So I just go into, let's just say I've got 12 images that yeah. are at a high ISO, yeah. 6,400 and above. I'll do my noise reduction on the first one and then I'll just sync it across the other 12. Yeah. And then I never think about it again. I do a similar thing, actually, but but the other way around. Right at the end of the process, when all the editing has been done, um, I have three settings for noise reduction and sharpening. Uh, One is for the lower um, spectrum, so anything up to 1600. Mm -hmm. Then between uh, 2000 and 6400 ISO, slightly different settings. And then above that to to the 12,000. See, I apply zero noise reduction to any images lower than 1600. Right. Nothing. I like the grain in those images. Yeah. Uh, So nothing. Um, But that was it. And so no no clients have ever really said anything that I'm aware of anyway. And do you choose sometimes to take a picture in black and white? because of a low light noisy condition yeah i think i think that's a fair fair thing to say um not so much for the wedding stuff but uh, you know it, i oh, well, i just like doing black and white anyway yeah well it's <laughs> and if it's timeless if, if it's grainy and a bit out of focus and in black and white it's art it's it? art yeah. yeah christoph's a bit um, uh, um he's got no, he's snuck another question in under the radar boop, boop, boop. Oh. here because i funnily enough you mentioned his name and i, I had him uh, as somebody to to mention here as well so let's deal with your other questions well double christoph, christoph. double christoph hi kev neil uh, quick question from montreal canada to go along with your quick question <laughs> um uh, do you collect a fee up front to hold the date of a wedding is is it 50 percent up front or 50 percent on delivery a good a good strategy what's usually done in the photography business um it's very difficult really because i mean regions are also different um, you know what what mistakes uh, i might encounter as a rookie and I'm, i guess he'd like to see these off so um love your podcast even though i'm not a fujifilm user yes he's an olympus user I know that now um always in, enjoy your discussions and interviews it, i don't take 50 percent up front um i mean I, I take quite a low deposit for me. oh my deposit's 200 pound okay so yours is uh, 200, 200 pound and then the remainder is due 28 days before the wedding okay yeah uh but for my commercial work it it doesn't work like that at all no. you i do the work and then i invoice them afterwards right okay um but yeah i mean i um I've had this conversation a couple of times with other wedding photographers and, and, and I even saw, I stumbled across a website not so long ago where part of his marketing message was mm-hmm. that you only need to pay after the wedding. You only need to pay if you like the pictures. Just inviting a load of problems because even yeah. if you like the pictures, some people are chances in yeah, life, yeah, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, say, yeah. Well, yeah, they were okay, but tell you what, let's give you half. Let's give you half. But well, the thing is, I don't mind. I, I, I quite like the uh, the creativity of marketing and some people will come up with some really, really funky things and that's kind of funky. But the, there was a whole negative element on that website where it was like, you know, do not believe, you know, you do not you need to use photographers who charge you up front. They are just, you know, how you know you're going to get the pictures how do you know they're going to turn up etc etc and i was like whoa this is this is no That's good for the line. industry don't start going anything. down that line yeah. no no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no 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 definitely not so there you uh, go double christoph okay um kevin and neil eric from ottawa here our mutual friend patrick laroque turned me onto the podcast way back um careful how you say that uh in episode number three where you featured uh, part one of his mojo talk that was a great talk that one that was from last year's ex weddings stand by for this year's yeah i saw patrick a couple of weeks ago actually. did you is yeah. he well he's very well still very cool mr rock star yeah um episode eight social media was great stemming from that episode i have a series of questions uh, but, but they might be a good topic for a deeper dive I've, I've cut this down just a little bit here but how can a hobbyist photographer like myself drive traffic to my personal photo blog without telling without selling my soul to mark zuckerberg I, how can regular people people who don't consider themselves photographers find my stuff i know i could link to my blog on twitter with a million hashtags but which ones it'll only generate traffic from the fuji curious 
or I could link it to Facebook through various groups. But again, those are probably within the same photo echo chamber. Instagram seems such a waste of time to me. The algorithm's twitchy and it's a walled garden that's becoming increasingly difficult to leave unless you consider Facebook and WhatsApp leaving. Um, I'm very active on Flickr, where I arguably have the most interaction and no ads. The pro account is a godsend. But again, it's a smack in the middle of the echo chamber. It's, it's hard to draw people to the blog. Flickr doesn't limit external linking or anything like that. Should I just give up on the whole blog thing as a waste of time vanity project and bite my tongue and stick to Flickr, Insta or, or FB? Oh, it's a long question there. Well, interestingly, I picked up... The, when you mentioned the word vanity, or you mentioned the word vanity just mm. then, that's, that's the thing that was going through my mind. So, like... The blog, a blog or a yeah. website, yeah. typically is to sell something. Yes. Okay. You're selling your wedding services, or you're selling prints, or you're selling framed images, whatever, whatever it is. Um, you know, if you are, if you want people to come to that for one of those reasons, then you have to market it. Simple as that. You, you have to market it. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no point just having a telephone and without uh, giving people your telephone number. Mm. Um, however, if all you're interested in is somewhere to kind of, uh, you know, let people see, and is, it's not a vanity element to it, it's not about kind of selling prints or anything, it's not yeah. commercial, yeah. then somewhere like Flickr probably makes sense, you know, especially if it's working already for him. Um, but the fact that the the brutal fact of it is things like Instagram and stuff are are core. And and that that whole idea about the Instagram algorithm being rubbish and not getting reach, that's not true. That's that's simply not true. Most people misuse Instagram. They put way too many hashtags in, they do shadow um commenting, they they're shadow in commenting. Instagram pods. Yeah, I'll I'll comment on your Instagram picture if you comment on mine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Instagram picks it up in an instant and hates it. Uh, Instagram podding, same thing, just on a group basis. Yep. Too many hashtags. Um, automated Instagram and using using automated tools to post to Instagram. It's all picked up in the algorithm, and all those things are negative. So just use Instagram as it's meant to be used for. There's a social. Remember social. Remember the word the social. Social, social media. Social, yeah. um, um, there was interesting um, when when you when you talk about people's comments because um, actually engaging yourself in conversation is something that not just Instagram but YouTube like a lot. YouTube ah, YouTube yeah. like a lot. They like yeah. they like you to engage in conversation where you're. Well, you don't just say, thanks, man, for leaving such a great comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, you might write back and say, well, a really thoughtful comment. Um, mm. I see that you're a da 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 And you're really good at this. You're well, really good at that. Well, I spend quite a lot of time on YouTube making sure at the moment. I, mean, I don't have a following like you do, so it's easy for me. Mm. Um, but I, I really do like to engage and answer questions. A guy rang, uh, not rang, uh, uh, wrote in the, the other day from Canada and we had a long communication between us about guess what microphones <laughs> um, but you know it meant that I could ask him questions it is a two way thing it's social. Yeah, yeah, yeah. social 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 that's the word social yeah, yeah. social 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 uh, but I like that question Eric, Eric yeah. Delorme so I'm going to go first this week with a camera strap and you've got the camera strap so uh, thank you very much for your que question of the week for me I'm going to put it in the question of the week pile which is this little one just over there Okay, so my question, my next question is from, uh, and I, I, I had to pick this question out just based on where where Trevor is from. So this is Trevor Weimer, maybe Weimer, I'm not sure, from Chilliwack. <laughs> you made that up. No, Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. Ch Chilliwack. Do you know what? I, th I feel like we're not. nobody in the UK listens to us anymore. Oh, no, we did. It was all Welsh at the start of last week. Yeah. What are you talking about? So this is Trevor from Chilliwack, British Columbia. I've got to say it again. This is Trevor from Chilliwack. How do you spell Chilliwack? C H I L L I W A C K. There Chilliwack. you go, Chilliwack, British Columbia. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, ah. Chilliwack is the seventh largest. Are you listening, Alan Gump? Here Chilliwack is the seventh largest. <laughs> al, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what that word agglomeration. says. Agglomeration. Agglomeration in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, an agricultural community. Most of it's blah blah blah. It's quite large. One hundred one thousand residents. Yeah, it's reasonably large. I'd move there with a name like that. Yeah. Um, okay. My question is whether or not either of you play around with the dynamic range settings while shooting DR, audio 100, 200, oh. 400. Perhaps you can expand on this topic and if and when you use it. I don't. Mm. I leave it on auto. Okay. Is that lazy? Um, no, it's not lazy. However, I would suggest leaving it on 100. Oh, would you? I, I, my, my recommendation is if you're using the older X Trans sensors, i.e., XT1, X Pro One, XT20, all that kind of thing. Um, not XT2, not X Pro Two, mm. not XT3. I would, uh, I left mine on auto, okay, and just let the camera deal with it. Um, 
it probably makes sense to explain what those settings are more than just telling them what we use them for. Yeah. So the dynamic range is the in-camera's mechanism of trying to uh, keep detail in the shadow and highlight area to a certain extent. Um, and you have 100% and it's percentages, 100%, 200%, 400%. Yeah. And the best way to think about it is those as as um, mathematical equations. So 100% of one is one. <laughs> I thought I'd go with a really easy one to start with. <laughs> so 100% of one. Do you know, I used to freeze in class. <laughs> <laughs> when when somebody would ask me an easy question, I'd think, this has got to be a really d- a difficult answer. I'm going to have to bleep that out. That's uh, precisely what I felt. Well, you, you, the thing is, you could say agglomeration, whatever that word is. Agglomeration. They struggled with 100% of but one. But then if it's maths, warning, warning. <laughs> I'm done for. So anyway, 100% of one is one, which technically is off, Okay, yeah, which means yeah. it's not doing anything. 200%, 400%. And the way it manifests itself is it will increase the ISO hmm. um, to a minimum of 800, I think, ISO at 400%. So yeah, And it will try and keep the, da- the shadows that way. So I, unless, it's JPEG only, mm. with a couple of caveats mm-hmm. that, you know, there's so some... So shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter? Y- yes, yes and no. If you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter, but some RAW pieces of software will read that setting and does dark light, Does Lightroom? Yes. So right, it okay. will, sometimes you'd see a lot of people will have their RAW files come into Lightroom and also, suddenly they'll go really dark or they'll be underexposed in in, in Lightroom. Right. Um, and all you have to do is drag the exposure slider. I've up noticed it's that. An electronic Isn't that interesting? Thing. Yeah, okay, it's because right, you're yeah. using auto. Yeah. Um, so other than that, but if you are using JPEG, it will affect the JPEGs. Um, so yeah, 100% is off. Uh, I No real reason to use, like I would start thinking about using the higher percentages if I was doing a landscape or a seascape or something where there's a very big contrast between sky and sea. Right. Right. Um, but to be totally honest with you, you'd probably be shooting that in raw. So you leave it. You leave it on one hundred percent. Leave it on one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good bit of advice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian Openshaw. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Neil. Thanks for the podcast. Few of us that listen to the cast over here on the Emerald Isle. You must come and visit. I'd love. To, I'd love to do a. I'm pod- going. I'm going to Ireland. Over. Are you when? Uh, in July. Uh, wow. I've got two. I've got a street photography workshop in Dublin, street yeah. photography workshop in Belfast, and a wedding photojournalism wow. workshop in Belfast. You, uh, I thought you were going to say Kalani. I love Kalani. I shot a wedding in Kalani. I kissed a stone in Kalani. Did you? Yeah. Isn't that where the Blarney stone is? Is that the Blarney stone oh, in Kalani? No, Cork. No. Cork. There's, no, uh, there, there's a lovely... The Blarney uh, stone is in Cork, yeah. Is it? Right, yeah, okay. I did do that. But uh, that's a very good idea, Ian. Uh, we don't all shoot Fuji either, so it seems you may be crossing over into the land of Sony. My question is about the small extension type tubes that you can buy for macro work. Do they work well, or should I splash the cash and go for an actual man, uh, actual macro lens? I borrowed. I've got your sixty mil, haven't I, over there? Yeah, mm-hmm. which I think is a, a cracking mm-hmm. lens. I never got on with the macro, uh, little macro um, extension GB. I, I had things. the. I well, I still have the one point four extender. Do you using the extend? Not not tubes. They're extenders, aren't they? Extension tubes. I think they're typically called. But mm. yeah, they are. They they effectively make give it easier to close up photography I did actually I did use it and um, I, I did a blog post about it and right. I, the results were I loved the results did you very tricky to get the results though because focusing is difficult and of course yeah. when you get so close with the lens you block out most of the light yeah yeah so exactly. you know, it, it does it does present different different um, I got rid of both of them I sold them mm. in the end uh, I, you know I would probably if you can get a one to one macro lens probably the best thing to do have you got the 90 uh, no, I no. don't have the 90 mil. So you just got the no. 60. Yeah. People say good things about the 90. The 90 is meant to be amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have it though. All right, um, one more question, then we'll go for um, then we'll go for our interview. Oh no, we're uh, ooh, 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 oh, go on, steady on, squeeze one in. All right, okay. This is um, this is from Tony McLean. Yeah, Does that name ring a bell? No. Oh. Should it? Hmm. Uh, first off, I love your show. I'm currently traveling the world, and on long travel days, I actually look forward to plugging in my headphones and zoning out from the Asia chaos. I actually know Neil oh. <laughs> from a gym. I used to be a PT. Oh, in. Tony McLean! Ah. Oh, that Tony McLean! Yes, and when I found, uh, <laughs> and when I found him on YouTube, I've been a huge <laughs> fan of his work. Love yours also, oh, Kevin. Oh, Tony! Mm. Whilst travelling, oh. I have found myself falling in love with photography more and more every day. Earlier this year, I invested in an XT3, as we also make YouTube videos, and the features are fantastic. So, my question is this: For someone who is starting out and has ambitions of photography being a full-time career, for each of you, what is your golden nugget, if you will, of knowledge or advice? Thank you so much for your time. Oh, Keep yeah. up the great work. And I'm going to send my strap to Tony um, <laughs> because I feel sorry for him because he's obviously a very good friend of Neil and Neil just does not remember him. No, don't do that. <laughs> Gold nugget of information. I mean, that's a, yeah. from, from, from a whole career's worth. Um, go, uh, I have one. Go on then. 
just do it that's a really good that's one. it just get on with it do it don't don't fanny about anymore most people do that <laughs> you know i want to become a professional photographer i'm too scared of giving up blah 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 just do it just get yeah. on with it the, the longer you you know i had a conversation with Gemma a couple of weeks ago i have these kind of weird anxieties about do you kids getting old and you know like you know you blink and then they're 25 and hate you and stuff. i know what Gemma would say to that <laughs> But she, but she was like, you know what? You can you can worry about it. Yeah. And and actually, funny enough, I saw something from a post from Lee Glasgow on the on Facebook recently uh, I as well. Lee. Uh, a very wise words he yeah. says, and it was something along the lines of, you know, stop worrying about getting old. Just you know, you're going to get old. That's the fact. Uh, you <laughs> know, just just deal with it. You know, and 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 it's like I say to Albie every day. Albie, just get used to going to bed at night because it's going to happen for the next 90 years. <laughs> you know, just get used to it. Uh, you know, and every night it's, it's, it's the end. But, you know, just do it. Just get on with it. Just whatever your plan is, Tony, yeah. when you get back from your time in Asia, just don't procrastinate. Just work hard and do it. That's it. I, I did think about that. Uh, with the YouTube stuff I nearly chucked the YouTube thing in about six months ago because I thought oh you know there's all these great looking dudes on there like Peter McKinnon and people like that and what have I possibly got to offer this a bald greying guy <laughs> I've got nothing uh, nothing under the you know too old for it you've got a great great microphone <laughs> that's the only thing I've got going <laughs> for me Tony have a strap and you can work out with it as well um, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, right, part two. We'll do the self-indulgent moment soon, but part two of um, the, the interview with uh, John Swanell. We start this final part with John with a request made for a portrait shoot. It was a shoot that elevated John's work even further in the portrait genre and a shoot that was to come as quite a surprise. Um, Anna Harvey Vogue, she was just an editor of British Vogue, phoned me one day and just said, can you photograph a friend of mine and her two kids for it? They want a Christmas card picture, you know. So I said, sure. I said, who is it? They said, she said, I'll let you know near the time. I said, fine. And then about four or five days before, I thought better call up, see who I'm photographing. So, so I said, Anna, who, who are we doing? She said, Princess Diana and her children. So I said, um, how old are the kids? And she said, whatever age they were, I can't remember now, 10, 12, whatever. And um, so I, I thought, um, right, I, I got a table tennis thing in, so uh, something for them to do. They would come in, you know, and I just thought, I'll do a couple of her by herself as well, probably. And, and, uh, and while she's having her makeup done, you know, the kids might be bored. So I got a table tennis thing, and, and it was great, you know, because. Um, in fact, when she turned up, it was really quite funny. I was sitting on the table in the in the, my studio with my legs crossed on the phone to a friend of mine, and she was early. She came into the studio and she tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and there's Diana nose to nose. She said, um, "Good morning, I'm I'm Princess Diana or whatever." She said to me, and I dropped the phone onto the table, bounced off the table onto the floor. She said, oh, "I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry to disturb your phone call. I didn't realise you were on the phone." And I said, "No, I'm sorry. You, you know, I, I was expecting you at um, you know 11 instead of." She said, "Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a bit early, um, but there was no traffic and all this kind of stuff. Small talk." So anyway, she said, "I'll just go and get my makeup," um, and she introduced me to Harry and William, and off she went. And um, as I picked up the phone, and this friend on the other end, "Are you still there?" And, she, and they said, "Yeah. What was all that? What happened?" And I said, "Oh, uh, Princess Diana just tapped me on the shoulder, and I dropped." They, and they said, "Yeah, I believe that. I believe anything." Yeah. And so they didn't. You know, you, I got this quite a lot. You know, mixing with these people. And um, my dad was really funny. He's a really working class bloke. You know, really, you know, regular guy, uh, all his life. And, and he's not simple, but he's just a lovely man. And um, I, the pictures were in the paper of Diana and the kids, they were all over the place. And he saw my name under, underneath the, one of the pictures, you know, and he said, John, your name's underneath this picture. And I said, um, um, well, I did the picture, Dad. You know, and he said, you did the picture? Does that mean you met her? <laughs> and I said, well, I couldn't, I couldn't take the picture without meeting her, old chap. So, uh, he, you know, we all laughed about that. Anyway, uh, we played table tennis with the children. I played Harry, Harry again, my game, up to 21, and he beat me, really licked me as well. 20, 21 7 or something like that and then I played William and I beat William quite easily so um, Harry was the one that was uh, the, uh, the sporty one. You mentioned your dad there I would imagine your, your parents were immeasurably proud. Yeah sort of you know my dad was a regular guy you know worked sort of did a 10 hour day every day and and he was always worried you know he used to say to me even when I was making a few bob and you know getting doing quite a few pictures of, of important people and he was saying is everything all right he said you okay for money i said yeah i'm fine yeah i'm fine everything's fine he said um he said uh, and then he said you know you really ought to get yourself a steady job though and 
it was you know the old school you know he's had a, he had a steady job was in the same job for 30 years and um I think they just found it a worry that it could all collapse on me and I would be out on the street, you know, wouldn't we? You know, they, don't, uh, they didn't realise that people change jobs all the time. Did they, did they enjoy your success? I think they did, yeah. They, very did. they were very conservative in, in lots of ways. They didn't, um, you know, hound me with praise every five minutes. But, um, yeah, I knew they were kind of fairly proud. You keep a diary, don't you? A uh, journal, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, it's, it's only actually from 2000. I, when I photographed the Queen Mother... I actually photographed her for a stamp, and the stamp was the Queen Mother, the Queen, Prince Charles, and Prince William. There was four of them in the picture. It was a stamp, four of them. And the perforations went round their heads, each head. And um, and it was quite a tricky picture to shoot, because if they were too much to one side, it, the perforations would cut off an ear, or if, they, if the Queen Mother was sitting down, if it, she was too low, I'd chop her chin off or whatever. So I had to plan it, and I got four stooges in, exactly the same size as the four those four and um, and uh, got them exactly the right spot. And then I drew marks on the floor, chalk marks. So when they came in, and I said, you know, if you imagine if you stand here, you imagine if you sit here, you know, you, you, and the Queen Mother, and um, and the chalk marks. She said, what are those chalk marks? I said, is that, that's chalk mark for William and and um, and Charles, Prince Charles. Um, so I keep them in the right place. She said, so, she said, is that Prince William's feet? I said, yeah. She, well, you've got really big feet, you know, you've got really big feet. And of course, everybody laughed in the studio because it was being filmed by the BBC as well. And it broke the ice. It was great. I said, my God, you've got big feet, William, or something like that. And um, we all laughed our heads off. Anyway, I got the picture and, when, and we were all joking, having a good time. And I spoke to uh, Queen Mother quite a lot, mainly about Cecil Beaton, actually, because she was a big fan of his. They were good, good friends. And I'd worked with him a couple of times, just on his, on his last sort of days that he was taking pictures. And uh, when I went home, I told my, my wife Mary, and I said it was a really good day. Actually, it was really, I was really slightly worried because it was getting it right and everything. But I said it worked out really well. And she said, "For God's sake, why don't you just keep a journal? You know, you've got to write all this stuff down. You know what was said and all that kind of stuff. And then you can put the picture in the journal as well." And I bought a big album, one of these big albums from Smithsons, and I did that. I the pictures from the Queen Mother. That was the first one. And so um, I wrote about. You know the, the the whole day that we were shooting and um, the, you know the fun we had and what they said and everything it was it was um, it was uh, really useful and then everything I did after that every night I'd write in the diary I'd fill the diary up with um, who the people whatever whoever I photographed where I went and especially around the world you know I went off to Bhutan and um, shot there for for, for a magazine or a Telegraph I think it was and um, I had a week out there and I got all the pictures back and met a couple of you know. Uh, important people, monks and stuff, and um, it was, and so went to some wonderful schools and Tiger's Nest, you know that wonderful monastery up in the mountains. Well, when I look at your website, it, it's exceptionally varied. I mean, there's commercial alongside portraits, alongside uh, fashion, alongside nudes, alongside the royal family. I mean, it, it's an eclectic catalogue. I didn't want to be too narrow, you know. I, used to, I started off doing fashion, and then I did start doing lots and lots of portraits, and then nudes, and and then when I was away on trips around the world, you know, in Angkor Wat somewhere, or you know, in Australia, I'd, I'd you know I'd go out to Ayers Rock and do some pictures of Ayers Rock and, and Alice Spring, and and um, I just I used to always do have a couple of days off after a trip to go off and do my landscapes, you know. So uh, and then I had an exhibition of those and a book made up, and so. It's much more interesting. Life was much more interesting. Otherwise, I think it would be too narrow, like having blinkers on, just doing fashion, fashion, fashion. You know, it gets boring. In terms of portraits, there's Tony Blair, Richard Attenborough, Joanna Lumley, Twiggy. This is, this is a who's who list. Margaret Thatcher, the royal family, of course. Is there, a, is there a method by which you work when you approach a portrait shoot? Do you, do you ever feel intimidated or, or, or nervous at all? The first personality I ever shot um, one of my first jobs was John Hurt and um, I was so nervous the only time, that time I've been after him it, I wasn't nervous anymore but it, I was really nervous when he'd just done The Elephant Man he'd done Shakespeare and you know and I thought oh my god he's sort of an intellectual and I'm sort of you know a pile of rubbish and stuff what am I going to talk about I was really worried and I phoned all my friends anybody work with John Hurt does anybody know John Hurt somebody said to me yeah he drinks a lot he likes a drink you know he's a you know he's one of the finest actors in the country but he likes his drink so I got two bottles of champagne in I got two bottles of red wine two bottles of white wine and he turned up and uh, introduced it, it, itself and everything and uh, he had this jacket on that I didn't like at all and I was wearing a black velvet jacket and I said to him do you mind if I you know you know put you in my jacket because I'd like the black and he said yeah no problem no problem and then I said, um, 
and then it went quiet. You know, the, you know those silences. And I'm always trying to when you're working with people, it's trying not to have any silences. It's keep keep the conversation going, so they don't get bored. Because a lot of them can get bored, and their eyes start rolling. You can tell. And anyway, I said uh, it went quiet. And I went, would you like a drink? And he looked at his watch. It was ten in the morning. He said, a bit early, isn't it? I said. Yeah, yes, of course it is. Yeah, I'm really sorry, sorry. That's a stupid thing to say, you know, really, really sorry. He said, what do you got? <laughs> so I said, I got champagne, I got red wine, I got white wine. He said, yeah, let's start with the champagne. So we opened a bottle of champagne before we started taking pictures. And we and I was to ask him about the elephant man and about his work in, sh in, in the theatre and everything. And he was really good. He was telling me everything that ha happened. And then um, we finished that bottle. It was only me and my assistant and him, and my assistant wasn't drinking. And so we finished it off together. And uh, I said, I've got another one. Should we, do we have another one or should we start work? He said, yeah, let's have another drink. You know, so I opened another bottle of champagne. We, by this time, it was about midday, 12 o'clock. So we, we got, as we, we kind of nearing the end, I said, John, John let's get a couple of pictures in the bag. I said, you know, because I'm get, getting a bit uh, hazy here. <laughs> so we were both laughing. So I did some pictures of him. Lovely pictures, actually. Really good. And then I tried this there and I thought, while well, I've got him here. And then it was one o'clock, two o'clock, and my assistant laid out lunch. So we sat down for about two hours, actually, drinking and having lunch and everything. And I got the picture. But th there was that nice sort of feeling. He was such a nice bloke. He was such a lovely person. I didn't want him to leave the studio. You know, I just wanted to uh, ask more questions and like a like a big kid, you know, and um, and he was so easy going and stuff. And um, we got through six bottles by six o'clock. My assistant joined in afterwards and then we got through six bottles of, of I couldn't do that. So I couldn't get through one today. But then we, I don't know how we did it. And we were both pissed. I actually say we were both pissed. And I said, John, it was about six o'clock now, seven o'clock. I said, John, I'm out of it. I said, you know. I said, she, he said, where do, you, where do you live? I said, I live in Highgate. He said, I live in Hampstead. He said, could you drop me off? I said, drop you off. I said, I can't, I wouldn't be able to focus in the car. I wouldn't be able to drive the car. And he said, I said, oh, we'll get a cab and I'll drop you off in the car. He said, great. So we got a cab, drove up, got to Hampstead, got outside his house. He said, come in and meet my girlfriend. You know, um, I can't remember her name now, um, Lisa or Liza. I can't remember her name, but went in and she was cooking dinner. It was like half seven, eight o'clock. She was cooking dinner. And, uh, he said, um, she said, uh, oh, he said, this is John's one hour, you know, she's doing my picture. And she said, oh, do you want to stay for dinner? And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, not, um, uh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, I, I was still, still a bit hazy because from all the drink and everything. And, um, and the funny thing is, when, before I left in the morning, I said to my wife, she said, are you nervous? I said, yeah, I said, I'm really nervous. I said, I've got an idea. I'm going to get him in, take the photograph and get him out, you know, so he doesn't realise I'm not that bright. And, you know, I had this complexes you know this is the first time i've ever only happened this one time and um so i would said that's my plan so anyway so now it's eight o'clock and he said okay well listen there's a pub right opposite his house a little old pub in this in Hampstead. so he says to his wife um, his girlfriend i'm just gonna over with john have a quick drink and i'll be back in a few minutes and she said it's eight o'clock eight thirty at the latest okay and he said yeah fine fine so we went over and they knew him in the pub really well and we had another bottle of wine in there and you know, it was, you know, getting later and later, 9.30. I said, John, you know, you, you, Lisa said, you know, you, you know, 8.30, she's going to go mad. She turned up at quarter to 10, really unhappy about us being there. You know, I'm thinking, God, she's going to blame me for this, you know, and, and it wasn't me. I'm always trying to get home, you know. And I promised to God I went off and I got home about midnight and I, I got it into bed. My wife was already, my girlfriend was already in bed. And she said, um, I said, she said, how did it go? I said, well, the plan didn't quite go to go to the way I planned it. It didn't quite go to plan. And, uh, and by that time, I was so drunk. I mean, I couldn't remember much, you know. And um, the next morning, she was saying, you know, you were really out of it when you got in, totally out of it. And that was my first personality. And after that, I never worried. Yeah. <laughs> I never, I never, nothing ever bothered me after that. Obviously, that was a, a shoot you enjoyed for... For various reasons, but, th but there were other personalities, um, world leaders that you photographed, for whom I would imagine um, the the John Hurt trick would not quite have worked. I mean, let, let's take Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, well, I was photographing and I bumped into Terry Donovan. You know, Terry Donovan, who who, who died a few years ago. And I said, he said, what are you doing? What are you up to? I said, I'm photographing Thatcher next week. He said, oh, my God, it's going to be a nightmare. You're going to have trouble there. I photographed her a while back. He said, and I spent two hours setting the light up in her office, you know, she, she lived in just off of um, um, Eaton Square. He said, I set the lights out for two hours and she walked in and said, no, 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 Terry, this is no good. This is much too bright. Take that light down. And, and I had to relight the whole thing. And, um, you know, she gave me such a hard time. And anyway, so I went in and um, I looked at this 
wonderful room. It was a really nice room. And there was a desk and there was a big window behind it. And it was bomb proof because of the IRA. She just, she wasn't in office anymore. But was, they kept, you know, the, this bomb proof window. And there was a table and it had a leather top on it. And it had loads of things on it, pictures of her kids. And there was a bust of Churchill and her computer and loads of bits and pieces. And um, she, she uh, um, I thought I'd photograph her sitting on the desk with the light behind her. She came in and said, okay, this is one, where, where would you like me? I said, um, I said, I'd like you sitting on the desk. Yeah, she said, but that's the light behind me. She said, people usually do it the other way around with the lights coming in on top. And I said, well, that's great, isn't it? Because um, if they did it that way, it would, everybody does it that way. I'd like maybe to do it differently. It would be better if I did it this way, don't you think? You know, you don't want to do the same thing every time, do you? She said, she flustered a bit. Well, um, no, okay, okay, okay. She said, now what can I do? What, what, what can I, I said, uh, can we clear the things on the desk? And she went really quiet and everybody in the room went quiet, her assistant and everything. She said, well, what do you want taken off the desk? And I said, uh, everything. She said, everything off the desk. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I said, I give you a hand. She said, get away from my things, get away from, she said, and she went like this, rolled up her sleeves and took everything off the desk and put it some, you know, put it on other chairs and stuff. And she said, why do you want all the stuff off anyway? And I said, because the leather of the, of the, the top of the desk is so beautiful and it reflects the, w the window behind you. I get you and then I get the shadow. And either side of you've got this wonderful reflection from the, this leather. She said, oh, I see, right. You know, I see, I see. So anyway, I did the picture and she was really nice, really good. And then I thought, God, it would be nice to have a, a picture of, I like a picture of me and her together, you know. I know it sounds corny. I said, I said Mrs. Thatcher, do you mind if I just, you know, give my assistants a couple of, frames left in the camera could i sit next to you and just have a picture for my my journal you know so we you know she said yes got it come and see here come and see here so i went over and i sat i sat down here like this and she's sitting here and um i'm sitting here and my assistant's taking the picture and um i'm sitting there like this and she's sitting there like this and i'm thinking god this is a really boring picture you know so what i did was I slowly crept my arm around. I thought, what I'd do is i just put my hand over her shoulder, not even touch, but make it look like we're a bit more powerly, you know. Otherwise, it's a boring picture. And as I did it, I just touched her shoulder, and she went like that, and I went, <laughs> <laughs> And she went like this, really got a strict, like a schoolmaster. So I, uh, I didn't get my picture. I got a picture, a boring picture of us sitting there like a couple of robots. My thanks to John Swanell for being our guest. Two-parter. Uh, if you missed last week's podcast, you'll hear the first part, obviously. Um, on last week's Fujicast and I do intend um, if I haven't done it already because there's a bit of crossover with this episode uh, to, to release that on the Breathe Pictures podcast as a full episode as well right self-indulgent minute um, are you going first or me thank you uh, uh, you were first I went first last week thank you for your um, uh, for your comments that you leave on the because um, we didn't say what this is all about last week oh, yes. so anybody is confused it's it's from the Apple Podcast reviews and they're very much appreciated the comments you leave and very important and very important oh yeah extremely important they are the lifeblood the lifeblood of the show, <laughs> of the show. <laughs> can't get enough of this Neil and Kevin are addicting uh, addicting to listen to if you're a Fuji owner it's very helpful but it's also for anybody who simply loves the art of photography he's a too humble gentleman of the photography community uh, from Jay Cubit. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, Barry Clarin. Barry Clarin. Clarion. Uh, I follow Kevin for a while on YouTube and was delighted to subscribe to this podcast with Neil. I listen in the car on the way to work much better than news and many more laughs. Not really about the gear, but more about their work and approaches um, to business guests. It's great to keep yeah. up the good work. The news is so miserable as well. It's always about Brexit and Trump and stuff. Um, Kevin and Neil make a great duo covering mostly wedding, street and documentary photography but really anything photo related listening to the podcast great fun due to superb sound quality and the humour and knowledge of them both thank you Robin Nickel Moses from Germany is, uh, brilliant podcast I love listening every Monday they give loads of information on all aspects of photography and there are some great interviews with some awesome photographers of our time and two thumbs ups two thumbs up Andy Photo love this podcast am I allowed to finish that or you've started so you may finish really informative with a nice relaxed vibe Perfect to listen to when editing weddings. I don't listen from episode one as I shoot... Uh, I didn't listen, sorry, from episode one as I shoot Sony and thought it would just be Fuji. But there's definitely something for everybody. I've been binge listening ever since. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy, and much appreciated. Right. Um, should we, should we talk a about the negative one? Oh, have you got it? Uh, no, but I remember it. Go on, then. We're boring. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you, Actually, in fairness to the guy, he he, he uh, it, it was a one-star review, slightly out of context. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, kind of. But he said um, it was good, and then it became boring. Yeah, um, I'm so sorry then, about that. One-star review. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think that might have been my mum. <laughs> really, I think it might have been Gemma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. general there's not enough life. gold bloom on it for, no. for jeff goldblub five stars <laughs> right questions um you go first okay so uh it's quite a long question actually it's from i might um praise you a little bit dig from, in everybody from, dig in. from james souls why do people have so such beautiful names no, souls no. Uh, hi, uh, maybe three years ago I was done with photography and bored of trying to get pixel perfect photos and all those hours of depressing fake smile group photos etc at mm. weddings. I couldn't mm. connect and lost the love of what I enjoyed. I was stumbling across Soraya Cordoval. Mm-hmm. Bing bing. She's, She's coming to the X conference. Weddings Conference. And then very quickly Kevin Mullins' work that showed me that you can shoot photos and work in a way that you actually believe in and make a career from it. Mm. Uh, following that I moved from Nikon to Fujifilm. Um, blah blah blah. Um, trying to develop myself <laughs> with the aim of giving up the day job and being a pure documentary wedding photographer working full time within the next two years. Okay. Mm. So here's the questions. Kevin you've mentioned that you work in Islands of Colour and in fact I think that's Neil's original idea uh, or original kind of thesis. Um Thesis is not the right word, is it? That's university writing. Mean, yeah, yeah. Philosophy. Yeah. philosophy. But I think from what you have said before, you often use your JPEGs as an end product as if they do not need heavy editing. I know you're shooting black and white a lot on JPEG plus RAW, but do you at some points during a wedding flick to colour setup in camera and shoot oh, colour JPEGs yeah. plus RAW so you can shoot those, uh, use those JPEGs as they will be in colour? Or do you simply use your RAW files to create your colour photos, if that makes any sense? Uh, there's a second part to the question, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and the answer is no. And this is what I do now. And this is what I've found myself doing probably since the XT3 has come out right uh, I shoot everything in black and white. Literally everything is in black and white yeah. film simulation. You never see what you're shooting in colour, do you? No. You've always said it's black and well, always, of late you have. Yeah. Always black and white. Yeah. Um, which obviously means that my JPEGs, I can't use the uh, the colour JPEGs because no. they're on and they no. do not exist. No. So for the colour stuff, I'm shooting JPEG plus RAW and I will go to the RAW. And in fact, more often than not these days, I just process from the RAW because I, you know, my presets and everything are, are just good to go and it's you know it's, there's no kind of delay the computer's quick enough or the files are small enough and everything um, so in most cases that's how I do it these days but mm. everything I see in the viewfinder is in black and white everything um, and the final part of that question is and it's a timely reminder when is the Brighton listener meetup? I hear you are buying the beers. I think that bit says, oh, yeah, it says here, I hear Neil is buying the beers. What? Uh, maybe we should set up oh, some form of so. listener Kickstarter campaign and raise some funds to hire a hall in Brighton, plus lots of beer and wine for the meetup. Well, well, that's that's a great like idea. a very yeah. good idea. Not only yeah. has he got a beautiful name, he's yeah. got a beautiful idea. Yeah. Um, but what was the date? Um, I'm going to have to look back in the calendar now because yeah. I've got everything here. September is, something yes. or other. Brighton, there we go. It's on the 10th of September. 10th of September. Tuesday, 10th of September. Yep. Tuesday, 10th of September is when we will be doing our Brighton meetup. Yes. For sure, 100%, all things being equal. Um, how that manifests itself is we're not quite sure yet. I'm sure there will be cameras and beer. I mean, if there's only two of us, and, and obviously... Uh, yes, and James Souls will be James, there, for sure. Then yeah. just the three of us. Yeah. That's going to be a big room full of beer, James. Isn't yeah, it? Ace. Hey? Cool. All right. Thanks, James. Are you staying down there, by the way? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I have thought so. So, meet up Tuesday, do some photography. Last time I was in Brighton, yeah. by the way, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I usually get accused of that. So, no, um, I, I stayed at the Grand Hotel. It was cheaper than the Travel Lodge. No way. Yeah. On the front? On the front. My room was at the back. I overlooked oh, the bins, okay. but it was a nice room. <laughs> a bin view. <laughs> um, but yes, it was £89. Did you for... not tell them who you know? They would have put you at the front. <laughs> I don't think so. Not for <laughs> £89. But yeah, the, the Grand Hotel. And the Travel Lodge was £110 same night. So you get everything on this. You get camera oh. tips, you get travel tips. And if you use there. hotels.com as well, that yeah. goes towards one of your 10 free nights. Does it? Yeah. This is just getting better and better. And if you use topcashback.com to go to hotels.com, you get a bit of cashback <laughs> off your 10 free rooms. <laughs> All right, stop now. <laughs> So yes, the tenth uh, Tuesday, the tenth, we're going to be in Brighton. We'll go yes. for a photo. We'll, we are going to record uh, an edition of the podcast. Of course, we are yep. while we're there. And then in the evening, 
Is it, is it, should you go out for fish and chips or, or can we do, because I much prefer doing an Indian in the evening or so. I love an Indian with friends and a, and a beer. Can we do that or does it have to be fish? Because we did promise fish and chips. I'll do fish and chips at lunchtime and then Indian in the evening. Yes. Okay, so if you're in any kind of food plan at that time, dump it, not for that day. Yeah. yeah. Ice cream. Don't forget the ice cream. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Lisa Harris. Hi, I'm starting a new portrait business. Starting small working with my NCT group. Starting small, sorry, working with my NCT group. I've been doing a little research into pricing for hour long uh, or day in the life type shoots. But there's nothing really to guide me at this stage in my very early work commercially. How would you start? Um, I did say how long's a piece of string, this one really, because uh, a lot of people that start with the NCT group, obviously, you, you form this great business relationship straight away with, in, in a tight circle that become a, a superb referral group for you. Um, that, that, you know, it, it's very tentacular by, by nature. It sort of reaches out to other groups as well. So I think you're in absolutely the right place, Lisa. Pricing? Okay, pricing for, um, for Day in the Life. I've heard all sorts of prices from... £200 through to, um, I can't think of the guy's name that does it for, oh, it's just shy of £2,000. Wow. But there, you know, it's like anything in, if you like, if you're going to give it the art label, one person's piece of bricks is, a uh, pile of bricks is a, is another person's art installation, isn't it? You know, it's, it, you get what you feel the, your market will pay. Yeah, if it's day in the life specific stuff that you're interested in, there is an amazing uh, photographer in America called Kirsten Lewis. Oh yes, um, and she. If you go into Creative Live, there's a whole kind of five day workshop with her. They're usually pretty cheap, yeah, yeah. and you download it all. I don't know, something like eighty nine dollars or something. Uh, but Kirsten Lewis, and um, she's amazing. Her work's amazing. Mm. But on that Creative Live um, workshop, you, she talks all about pricing and how to price and why to price and what to price. Um, and you probably get a lot more out of that than than us as kind of giving you guidance on it, really. Um, but ultimately you know you price what you think you're worth not what you think you'd pay for yourself isn't that the we're going back to that um oh who was it the um, the american wedding photographer we both love what's the matter with us this week <laughs> um oh don't give me any clues i know the answer i'm just not saying it i'm enjoying this <laughs> you're being horrible <laughs> jeff goldblum i love his work <laughs> My brain is, hold warning, on, warning. it's overloading. <laughs> it's going to go. Uh, Joe Busink. God, how could I? I would not have forgotten that. No, well, no, would I usually? Because I always talk about him. And actually, he, he even, uh, he mentioned, he, he he sent you a message on your YouTube film recently. He did, recently. Yeah, yeah, which I was really, really. Did. I, um, yeah. Well, you knew him first, obviously. Uh, actually, we both went to a workshop with him, didn't we? Was it a Jorgensen albums or no? It wasn't Jorgensen. It was. Uh, um, it was organised. Oh, this is hideous. <laughs> Are you listening to us both struggling? Here? Come on, Granddad. Oh, oh, it was organised by an album company, wasn't it? <laughs> I just said D- that. Don't give me any, no, but it wasn't them. It's Scottish one. Um, it was Loxley. Uh, Loxley. Yeah. <laughs> You're hearing us fall apart here. <laughs> We're not going to edit any of this out. We're going to leave that in because I. <laughs> uh. But uh, I can't even remember what the point was now. Uh, I said, um, uh, charge what you need to pay. Uh, char- it, Joe, Joe Busink yes. said it was years before he could afford his own rates. Correct. Which I thought was a was a, <laughs> it was a really cool yeah. phrase. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. So there you go. But anyway, Kirsten Lewis is your point of contact, love point Ker- of reference. Love Kirsten. Do you, look at, I'm looking at Kirsten Lewis's um, mm. website here, and it's kirstenlewisphoto.com if you want to go search for it. Mm. There's a lovely d- a picture of a family coming off the beach they're all looking great and it's the dad that's struggling with all the 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 inflatable toys and stuff isn't it brilliant great a great i love it yeah great observation so thank you very much lisa for your question right your one okay david paima p-a-i-m-a where's he Um, from well he actually says hello mr mullins oh no mention of you though my name is david paima greetings from peru Mm. I don't know if we've had Peru before. You're big in Peru. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sharing your personal experience as a photographer and photojournalist. I have been listening to Futurecast every week so I can absorb everything you teach and share. He still hasn't mentioned you. No. I, <laughs> I'm going to start my own wedding photography business here in Peru. I am both thrilled and fearful at the same time. May I ask what your steps, uh, or what steps you would suggest to follow in order to have success besides being a good photographer and having the right tools? 
I know there isn't a shortcut to success. I want to just know if I'm on the right path. This right. is what I've got so far. Number one, create a business plan. Number two, create my portfolio. Number three, create a website. Number yeah. four, advertise my work on social media. Yeah. This is basically what I have been taught. What do you think? Well, I mean, I would say that's pretty sensible order Sounds like of things. Your ducks are in order there, as they as they say over here in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. But what I would say is right at the very beginning is try not to worry too much about the technicality. I mean, yes, business plan and stuff like that are important, but don't don't be obsessive by it. Don't you know? Don't mm. you know? If your business plan spits out, you know, you need to earn a hundred thousand US dollars a year to 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 survive. Don't let that put you off, you know, starting is, is my point. Um, the portfolio and website and everything, keep that as simple and as quick as possible. You know, make your make your um, make your presence, your which becomes your brand about your about you as a personality. Your pictures must tell a story about you as the person behind the lens as well as the pictures that you take. Yeah. Um that way you'll attract the people that, that want those pictures. Um you know, try not to fall into the trap of just showing the pictures that you think are going to get the bookings yeah. because that's not always the ones that you want to photograph. Um and yes, of course, advertising social networks important, but word of mouth, friends, when you're starting out, you know, speak to your friends and you know, hey, um fellow friend in Peru you know mm -hmm. any of your I don't know how old you are but if you're if, if they've got friends getting married or friends of friends or their daughter or son's getting married and you know just offer to say you know what I'm just uh, you know I'm, I'm available a, I'm, I'm here I'm yeah. an adequate photographer yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah. just interested in this and I'm not going to charge a lot but you know I just want to get my foot in the door and uh, don't make any kind of promises and and away you go and that's 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 the key thing um and soon enough, you'll figure out whether you enjoy it or not, and then then yeah. the passion will flow. Many champions of, of business, large organisations, have never written a business plan in their entire life. Mm. And I, I always remember a, a bank manager that um, I, I, when I first got into this business, I, I needed a loan for some kit. And I went to see the bank and um, the I kind of knew the bank manager a bit anyway because he'd been to a local networking group that I belonged to. So I guess some of this was, you know, his humour. But he did say, that's the greatest work of fiction I've read all week to me. And effectively threw my business plan in, in the bin said, right, let's start again and wrote it on a post-it note. The, the most important thing is that you know, you need to know what you need to live off. Mm. Um, you know, you need to know that figure before you can structure any price or think about anything at all, including purchasing. Um, and that can just be on the back of a post it no yeah, back of a cigarette yeah, box yeah. whatever it is you know you just need to know that figure there is no point and and it will just end in disaster if all you do is put your finger in the air and think uh yeah i'm going to charge 250 because 250 pounds sounds quite a lot for just one day's work which it does um because that won't be enough and and especially if you're looking towards moving away from a daytime job you absolutely need to think about it as a full-time job independently of that don't look don't back yourself up with mm. the, the money you earn from your day job separate them completely and only then will you figure out whether it can work or not i still i mean it, it's, all, it's all relative to how much you need to earn yeah oh absolutely but, but yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I still you know in in the uk when i see people doing full day uh, packages. Uh, if you want, I hate the word package. It always sounds like a, a, a cheap Thompson holiday or something. But but um, well, there's nothing wrong with Thompson holidays, by the way. I've been on my Thompson holiday was very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Other package holidays <laughs> are available. But I, I I still worry when people say you know it's seven or eight hundred pound for a whole day, get an album with it and all that sort of stuff. I'm thinking where on earth is the profit in this? Because if you actually looked at the time it took to not only shoot but the, mm -hmm. the the preamble that you do with them, have a chat with them beforehand, selling it of course in the first place, maybe some marketing involved. Um, it's surely the time that you spend editing, presenting. Possibly you will also do something where they come and meet you afterwards. Eight hundred quid. I mean, you you yeah. you're better off to go and work down the supermarket. Well, absolutely. On an hourly rate. An hourly rate. I I fully fully believe that eighty percent at least of wedding photographers in the UK earn less than the minimum wage mm. in terms of hourly hourly rate. Because you can't just see it as eight hundred pound for the day no. and think, well, not many of my mates work. You know, make that in a day. No, exactly. But the the difference is if those people have a day job and I, I you know sometimes wish I had a day job so I'm not I'm not kind of um, dissing them for doing that but that's what I'm suggesting is that if you do have a day job and then 800 pounds a couple of times a month is seen as a, a just a really great piece of pocket money yeah. there's no need to to increase that but that value or that but that um, price point but if you separate that out from your daily income from your income from your I don't know being your 
fireman or doctor or whatever mm, it is mm. um and look at that uh, you know through through a, through different eyes then you will figure out actually I, could i run a business on this 800 pounds mm. without my other income and the answer would be no simple as that um and then so then that should make you start thinking actually this is what i want to do um however saying that there are plenty of people who have a day job and i'm more than happy to charge 800 and less and and that's fine yeah. you know that's fine that's that's the way they want to do it um but for many of us it's our livelihood and so we just can't you just can't charge 800 pounds and, and and make a living out of it martin Stahl's photos this one is for neil or perhaps kevin too with your photo films what do you say to the videographer who wants to record sound do you both record sound or do you insist you do it I had a run-in with a videographer on Saturday who said, as a photographer, I should concentrate on stills and let the professional handle the sound. Whoa, for a start, I'd throw his head in a bucket of water. I'll throw a bucket of water over him. Uh, Martin, a very good point there. And, um, you know, for, for those that uh, know of uh, the work I do with photo films, which is, you know, it's a film of stills, but along with that, those stills come the the sounds of a day and that could be speeches it can sometimes be what people say to each other one of the nicest pieces i've had of late is uh, when the dad was standing outside the room before he went in to see his bride for the first time in her dress he was a bag of nerves and the stuff he was coming out with was just lovely he was recounting all sorts of stuff to me and i thought just just keep talking just keep talking um that and it, it can be all sorts of things it doesn't have to be just wedding related i think if you're doing day in the life shoots just you know somebody reading a story to their child or you know you're out playing and and you've got the uh, we talked about binaural sound recently the, you know the sound of what's going on in the park or just adding layers of texture to your film and not just you know soft music if you if you make um, these um, the 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 slideshows can be very very precious but to answer your question martin if a videographer said that to me i'd say that's cool um let's have an agreement here are you know are you going to send me the audio from all the speeches if you are great uh, and I'd, I'd make sure that that was um agreed before the actual wedding um but equally i'd probably and i do do this when i work with videographers i will ask that question in front of the bride while the makeup is being done in the morning i'll say are you um you know Bob, are you cool to send me that audio? Um, because that's the only way I can make the photo film. I know it's, you know... It's what happens if it goes badly wrong and they they mess up the audio? Well, they have, and I had that recently. Um, a, a guy, and I, I should have known this as he was doing it. He, he couldn't give a <coughs> t- about being there. At, um, sorry, I shouldn't use that language. I was told off the other day by by my wife for saying that at the, the, the dinner table. And, and, she's, and one of the boys said, what does that mean? Um... What did you say? Can you teach me the salad? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just words. Stop being... Yeah, um, yeah I, 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 he couldn't give one about, about this wedding. I knew it. And he was full of himself about, about being, you know, oh, I come from LA and I, I work in the film industry over there. Hmm. And, and I just thought, yeah, it's all very lovely, but do you actually care about what you're recording? He only had one audio pack, so you know that's useless when it comes to recording four speakers. Yeah. So um, I had to work only with what he gave me. The bride, fortunately, was very understanding. Mm. Okay. So now, no, I want to know what they've got in their bag. Do you have enough packs? Are you going to call? Are you going to record every single speaker? So if he's if he had, if he agrees to record the audio and share it with you, yep. did, is he expecting some kind of kickback from you for that? No, no. I mean, he's agreed this up front with the uh, with with the bride. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Sounds very good. I always I always know uh, a lot of the time I work with videographers who actually a lot of them, uh, sorry, n- not a lot of them, but um, you know a good few that I that I. Uh, if that's not an oxymoron, um, that I work with, trust me to do the audio. Hmm. And I, I'm, I'm as good as gold. The first thing I do when I download, download the audio. It's emailed to them within 24 hours, possibly before I've even gone to bed that night. Hmm. It's yeah. easy. It's not difficult. Well, they would they would trust you because you have a very nice microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I carry it everywhere with me. Your question. Uh, I think okay. we've got time for one more. All right. Okay. So um, this one is from Timothy Binder. Ben, Ben, Bendner. 
Bentner. He's put that in his uh, brackets. Yes. Pre- present, uh, pronounce oh, it to uh, Bentner. An Arsenal fan. An uh, Arsenal player called Bentner, wasn't there? There was. Yeah. Uh, he was Nicholas Bentner. He, he was from uh, Holland. Dutch. He was Dutch, I think, wasn't he? Was he, he Dutch? Or he was, was he very Danish? Good player. Something very, like that. Very good player. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, um, and also, Timothy, I'm uh, Tim, I'm very much aware that I have an email from you that I have not answered <laughs> uh, several times. I know. Um, I've just been a bit busy, but I'll get to it. I um, uh, love the podcast. I've been listening from the beginning. My question is more about shooting style maybe mm-hmm. when i shoot nature and architectural mostly i go handheld and shoot one or two images of something and move on i have friends who rapid fire even still objects and come out with a great shot for me it's like shooting fish in a barrel i know everyone is different but wanted your take on if shooting 30 to 50 shots of something not moving really displays someone's ability or just more luck hmm. mm. well we've talked about that in a, from a wedding point of view before um and people do things very differently um but from a static object point of view, I mean, that doesn't make me, you know, if I'm taking a picture of what's in front of me right now, which is a, a keyboard, I would take one picture, I would review it perhaps on the back of the camera, and that would be it. I wouldn't, yeah. I would have no need to take more than one picture of that, um, especially a static architectural shot. I don't see the point in just, yeah. just for the sake of it. Take your time, um, queue it up, get the picture you want. Yeah, I mean, I can understand on. it for moving stuff, and especially um, wildlife, of course. I mean, you, you know, you just mm. you shoot everything in wildlife, and something's going to be sharp, hopefully, in the middle of it, um, or you're going to get that that expression. Do you see that um, golden eagle picture recently on the internet? Uh, it's got oh, the one picture. the wings just yeah. dipping the water. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That was incredible. very good, wasn't it? Yeah, incredible. Um, so I'm sure he took more than one picture of that. But yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, I did. I think people people seem to forget also that cameras are, uh, you know, they're they're mechanical, and eventually, mm. the more you the more you press that button, the, eventually it's going to fall out the bottom. Mm. So, um, can can I ask you a question about not not spray and pray necessarily, but fifty six. Uh, I love the fifty six millimeter lens because mm-hmm. eighty five mil equivalent is one of my favourite um, favourite um, focal lengths to to work with. Yeah. I went last week. to to um, photograph, well, I was I was w- with uh, with the boys as they were at a birthday party doing a karting event, which was great fun. Nice. Um, I I needed a bit of throw to to get you know each individual cart in in frame, so I used the fifty six millimeter and uh-huh. I used it on um, continual focus. Uh-huh. I had a rough old time getting anything in focus though. Any any? Um, I know uh, plenty of people. I honestly I use the 56 in continuous focus for walking down the aisle and things like that and you I mean it's not as mm. quick as the uh like 23 or 35 no um, so don't expect it to be. And if you're doing like karting, fast action karting, oh, it and was stuff, very fast. Yeah. Then yeah, it's probably not going to be quite up to it. But and I stuck myself on the apex. So did you use the really um, the wide zone focusing mm. tracking in the camera? No. Oh, that's what I should have done. Mm. Oh. Amateur mistake. Yeah, that would have helped. Yeah. Um, although, you know, in fairness, it's it's not the quickest lens in the world. So, no. um, but yeah, well, there we go. So I feel like can I win a camera strap? Something like the ninety mil, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ninety mil or the um, what's the other one? The, is it one hundred and ten? Um, is there one hundred and ten? I don't. I don't. Past far past fifty six. I don't. I don't the use it. Listen to me, uh, Fujifilm Ambassador, I can't remember the name of the lenses. Oh, it's the same as me, I don't really have any longer than that. Mm. But um, I mean, I've used the 50 to 140. No, yeah, there's another, there's, I'm sure it's 110. But anyway, mm. there's a, there's another prime that is meant to be rocket fast. Is there? At uh, focus tracking and stuff. All oh, right. Um, and that will give you, obviously, that big bokeh. I must look into that. Bokeh. Bokeh. Somebody in the meantime will write to us and say, you know that lens you were talking about is this one. Mm. Can I be co-presenter yes. on the show? No, no that's fine. Yeah. Um, um, just before we uh, leave this week, um, a, a quick mention again for the X Weddings conference. Yes. Um, dates and details again. Uh, X Weddings conference, 13th, 14th November 2019 in Bath, um, England, near Bristol Airport, for those who need to know. Um, uh, it's very yeah. easy, actually, from the airport. It's great. And Bath is a beautiful, beautiful place. Yes. Um, and Make it we'll, a holiday. We'll be there, and the other speakers will be there, um, including uh, Wojta Hurt. <laughs> you're there, you're there. You've got it, you've got it, you've got it. Soraya Cordwell, Chris Parkinson, Scott Johnson, and Matt Thompson. Yeah. Uh, and it's fun. It's good fun. It's good fun. 
I'm looking forward. To, I'm looking forward to listening to them all. But Soraya Courtville, in, in particular, Soraya is amazing. Yeah, uh, with with her work that she she does with the NGOs and stuff like that. We'll have a little mini um, trade show type thing there as well. So oh, will I think okay. uh, Jorgensen are, are going to come along with some albums. Fabulous. Fuji Film will definitely be there with good. all of the any new stuff that might be around that time and <laughs> uh, all the good stuff that Hang on, they if, will bring. If I had a, if I had a ding. Linton and I uh, sound effect. You'd now they, be hearing. They that. might have a GFX 100 there or something. Well, perhaps. they might, might have something else as well. Mm, who knows what, what, what happens? Really? But they're going to have all of their gear that's available at the time there. Um, we will. We'll hopefully have um, London Camera Exchange and a few other bits and pieces and uh, beer and food. And Actually, that's talking. what you should Education. have along, alongside Jorgensen and and Fujifilm and all, all the other uh, great trade chaps and chapesses. What about a real ale? Sort of a bit left field here. A real ale company, just yeah. I'm not sure the Hilton would be up for that though. Oh, that's a good point. Mm. Oh, I completely forgot about that that part of it. See, that's why you're organising this, and I'm not. Mm. You've got a great <laughs> microphone. <laughs> right. Thank you very much uh, for all your questions this week. If you'd like to send one in, because you are the lifeblood of the show. <laughs> then it is click at fujicast.co.uk. And don't forget the competition. So if you if you want to have uh, a chance of winning the free ticket to the X-Weddings Festival, just mention that in your email, uh, your normal email. I would like to go to the X-Weddings and we will uh, we'll, we'll look at that. And yeah, and, and, and obviously when it, when it comes to the, you know, the week itself, uh, you'll be a VIP right at the front. Yes, guaranteed. VIP. You'll have to wear the hat. Guaranteed. <laughs> guaranteed there will be a hat. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Um, payoffs. Well, actually, very, very soon, Gemma has promised to do... She wants to do a payoff, doesn't she? She's quite excited about the... the Gemma does want to do a payoff. Of a payoff. Yes, she's going to do it. And what's Rosa going to feel when she's been knocked off this constant week-in, week-out payoff? Well, we were in the car a couple of weeks ago driving to my sister-in-law's listening to one of the podcasts. And, oh, God, uh, not the language. And, uh, oh, and, and, and Rosa, when she heard her payoff, she was like, oh, ding. Well, here we go, Rosa, this is for you. My dad's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye. His website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk or for street workshops, training and everything Fujifilm, go to f16.click. And for me, our Thomas. My dad's Instagram is Neil James. See his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo. His website is neiljames.com for pictures and one to one mentoring. And you can hear his other photography podcast, which is called Breathe Pictures, wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, and don't forget his name is spelled. N-E-A-L-E We will see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.